So in this section, we are finally going to see how we go about trying to extract the properties of the fringes that are produced by our interferometer. Now we've seen it on multiple occasions now. Um, fringes are essentially just sinusoidal functions. And sinusoidal functions are pretty simple functions if you think about them. In fact, you can constrain all of the values that these uh, functions take with only uh, four numbers if you run it, really want to be thorough about your actual description. The uh, first number that really matters when you're looking at a periodic function like a cosine or a sine is of course the period, uh, the spacing between the bright, uh, two consecutive bright fringes. Now we know that um, the period of the fringes is something that is entirely constrained by the actual design of our instrument, whether our interferometric combiner uses coaxial or multi-axial, um, we are going to have a different uh, fringe spacing. We'll just assume that this is a given at this point. We all know what type of interferometer we are dealing with and we know what uh, period to expect. The other numbers, on the other hand, we don't know them. The, uh, the first important number is going to be the amplitude of the modulation um, we see in our interference fringes, which is something we are going to relate to the visibility modulus of our uh, coherence function. The other number that matters is going to be the phase. That is, in a way, the location of the first bright fringe uh, in relation to a predefined position, uh, which we typically label as zero on our plots. And the last number that also matters happens to be the overall, the average intensity, uh, which we've labeled I0, uh, which is simply the uh, total amount of flux we acquire over uh, a scan of fringes. Altogether, these numbers allow us to write this very nice functional expression that gives an expression for the intensity as a function of the fringe, uh, the, the position on the detector or the, the, um, or the, the OPD position for a, for a coaxial inter, uh, beam combiner interferometer. We've said that the, um, the spacing between the fringes, the period, is something that is a given. The other three numbers are the ones that we really need to extract out of those uh, fringes because they are the ones that are going to give us access to the actual expression for the complex visibility. How would you go about doing something like this? Well, there are lots of options, in fact. And we're going to look at the, what I would call the bare minimum option, which is really a, a, a potentially very efficient way of going about extracting that information. You see that the um, fringes are periodic. We've said that many, many times by now. Um, so that means that um, whether you have one 10 or 100 of fringes, you essentially repeat the same pattern over and over again. So really, why bother? Or why don't you just sample things over the scale of just one of the cycles? And uh, we're going to uh, look in detail at one of these cycles. And instead of trying to continuously extract for the fringe information, what if we design, uh, what if we were to design um, a combiner that extracts information at four specific um, OPD points, uh, points of optical path difference that are equally spaced within one wave cycle. The reason why you want to do four is simply a matter of um, number of constraints versus number of unknowns. You have three numbers you try to characterize. We've uh, highlighted the phase, the amplitude, and the mean intensity. So you at least need three measurements uh, in order to constrain the, the three, uh, the three um, data points you're trying to extract. Now we make it four, uh, just to over-constrain a little bit the problem, and also because uh, in the case of four, there is a very nice um, formal solution, which we're going to uh, see in just a minute. So here are your four points, the intensity measured in four uh, different uh, locations along uh, one cycle. 
And the game is to find the interference function, to model the interference function that is going to fit within those four points. You know, do something like that. Uh, or in the, the, the same way, uh, if you have um, different data points like this, uh, you're going to have uh, you're going to have to find the, uh, the the three parameters i mu and phi that best fit um, the data points here. Now the good thing about this implementation, where you have four points that are equally spaced along one cycle, so you have a spacing of lambda on four uh, between between uh, each position, uh, is that um, you have an actual analytical uh, solution for for this if you uh, use the following notations where you introduce two additional quantities x and y where x happens to be the output a minus c and y the output uh, b minus d and you introduce the total um, the sum of all of the intensities that you sample along these cycles and then you can come up with direct analytical expressions for the, um, the, uh, the mean intensity, which happens to be uh, a quarter of uh, the total uh, intensity, of course, because there's four outputs, and the visibility squared and the phase have those very nice analytical expressions. What's pretty interesting about this is, one, it's uh, potentially very simple to implement, and two, it potentially makes a very efficient use of uh, light and, and in and detector space, for, ex for example, because you only have four outputs coming out of your detector uh, to it toward your detector, and uh, you, uh, you make a very good use of, uh, of this very efficient use of the light. Now, there are other methods to go about the exact same problem, and that other method uh, relies on an operator that we've encountered a couple times now, uh, that we call the Fourier transform. Again, we start from fringes, which are simply sinusoidal functions, and uh, instead of directly working on the uh, fringe space, what we're going to do is uh, compute, uh, typically using a um, uh, pre-made pre algorithm, uh, what we call the, the Fourier transform, or more precisely, what I'm plotting here on the screen is the square modulus of the Fourier transform of that fringe function, something that we usually refer to as the power spectrum of the fringes. Now we see that there is a direct relationship between the properties of our fringes and the properties of our Fourier transform, thankfully. The, um, the first bit of information we see uh, is that the, um, the mean intensity level of our uh, fringes is going to find itself uh, encapsulated in the central peak that you observe in the Fourier transform space. That uh, central peak is surrounded by two side lobes, which happen to correspond to the actual sinusoidal modulation. The reason why you observe two side lobes in the Fourier transform is simply uh, because of some mathematical properties. Um, a cosine function can be thought of as the sum of two complex exponential functions, one with a positive sign and one with a negative sign that place uh, the two peaks on either side of our uh, central uh, peak. Now, how does that help you extract the information you're looking for? Well, quite simply, the, uh, the, the levels of um, intensity of the different peaks, the central one and the side lobe ones, are directly related to the, um, the intensity, the mean intensity, and the, the modulus function. To uh, extract the, the visibility modulus and the fringe phase, you simply, uh, in the case of the uh, visibility modulus, take the ratio of the intensity of those side lobe peaks uh, by the, uh, the intensity of the central peak, and that gives you direct access to the visibility modulus. And for the phase, in theory, what you simply have to do <coughs> is look at uh, the phase of the um, Fourier component that you've ext extracted uh, simply by computing the Fourier transform in that space. 